April 27th, 1994, and the eyes of the world are on South Africa as her people go to the polls for the very first time. Twelve days later, on May 9th, Nelson Mandela becomes the country's first democratically elected leader, taking 62.9% of the vote to former President F.W. de Klerk's 22%. After more than four decades of apartheid, and after four years of intense negotiation, the dawn broke on a new South Africa, one of hope, equality, and togetherness. It seemed like a dream then, and sadly, it seems like a dream now. South Africa, once an inspiration to fractured nations around the world, and a symbol of healing in a post-colonial world, is in crisis. The very existence of this young nation hangs in the balance. What's going wrong here? What has brought us up to this point, and what comes next? What hope is there? This is what we're going to be examining today as we put a modern tragedy under the microscope. Load shedding is nothing new in South Africa. Since 2007, South Africans have battled with power outages and blackouts as the country's energy providers fight to keep the nation from total collapse. If you've never heard of load shedding before, you're probably not alone. This process, in which energy usage is controlled by planned outages at scheduled times, simply doesn't happen in most other countries where energy supply keeps up with the needs of the population. If you've spent any time in South Africa, however, you'll know all about this. You'll know about the struggle to make power output match up with demand. So who's in charge of this load shedding? Well, that would be ESCOM, the body overseeing South Africa's power utility. ESCOM announced the need for load shedding 16 years ago, and the people have been putting up with interruptions ever since. During COVID, however, things got worse, much worse. On September 17th, 2022, ESCOM announced a move to stage six load shedding. Basically, the shortfall between supply and demand was worse than ever before, to the tune of an astonishing 6,000 megawatts. This meant rolling blackouts as many as 18 times over four days in the worst hit areas, with outages lasting up to four and a half hours at a time. The new status of permanent load shedding essentially means the country can look forward to another two years of this, power cuts on an almost everyday basis. This is simply no way to live, and it's ordinary South Africans who are paying the price. For example, a user of the Q&A platform Quora, Michael Koberg, described how he and his family rely on rainwater tanks to ease their spiraling water bills following the death of his father. But this means relying on pumps and filters, which just do not work during power outages. Another South African Quora user, Selma Shipman, wrote about how it costs her 1,000 Rand, almost 54 US dollars each week to keep her generators running during stage six blackouts. As a pensioner, these costs are crippling Selma. Is there no way out of this cycle of shortfalls and power cuts? There should be. Some have cited the stranglehold that fossil fuel companies hold in South Africa, suggesting that a move toward renewable energy sources or an expansion on the already existing nuclear grid could ease some of the burden. Others have suggested a more deep-rooted problem, corruption. In 2019, two former ESCOM managers were arrested on charges of corruption and fraud totaling more than 745 million rand or 51 million US dollars at 2019 rates. More recently, it's been suggested that corruption at ESCOM went all the way to the top as it was alleged that President Cyril Ramaphosa and senior members of his cabinet knew about the corruption at the heart of ESCOM. Andrei de Reuter took over at ESCOM in January 2020, becoming the energy body's 12th CEO in a little over a decade. De Reuter was public in his calls to root out corruption at the organization, something which evidently did not sit well with some of the shadier characters involved. In December 2022, following the shift into stage six load shedding, De Reuter became yet another casualty of the ESCOM hot seat when he resigned from his post. But he very nearly became a casualty in the truest sense of the word. Speaking after his resignation, De Reuter explained that ESCOM was now a target for organized criminals and corrupt politicians, and that an attempt had been made on his life with cyanide-laced coffee, something De Reuter was lucky to survive. But will South Africa survive this rampant corruption and organized thuggery in the institutions 
that are supposed to serve her? For now, this remains to be seen. For many South Africans living and working abroad in relatively safe countries, returning to the country means rewiring the brain to adapt to the danger South Africa poses on a daily basis. The jewelry and watches you wear in another country might come off, and your phone stays concealed in many areas. Your car doors get locked and stay locked. Traffic lights and stop signs become risk assessment operations with you looking around for potential danger in the form of hijackers. Houses that would sit serenely on quiet streets in other parts of the world are sealed off behind two layers of gates and walls, topped with electrical fencing and an alarm system with a direct link to a private security firm. And that's if you're lucky. And you also heard that right, it's not the police, but a private security firm. And these firms are armed. Semi-automatic rifles, body armor, pistols, you name it. Now, from Sydney to Southampton and from Paris to Pittsburgh, there are areas where it's best to keep your wits about you. But they all still pale in comparison to the instability and insecurity faced by South Africans on a daily basis, proven by the insanely elevated protective measures we just mentioned. Areas like Mitchell's Plain in Cape Town and Hillbrow in Johannesburg, just to name a couple, have become total no-gos for anyone not well acquainted with the place, and even then, it's best to take precautions. So what's going on here? The first thing that jumps out at us is a loss of control from the ANC government. In February 2023, Police Minister Beke Sele released the violent crime statistics for the three-month period between October 1st and December 31st, 2022. They make for a pretty grim reading. There were 7,555 murders in three months. A rate of 83 murders and 183 rapes every day for this period, an increase on the previous quarter. Action Society, a civil movement seeking to bring about a safer South Africa, was quick to criticize Sele and his fellow ministers, saying they had lost the war against crime and describing how the country has fallen into a bloodbath. After apartheid came to an end in 1944, South Africa began a process of democratization and healing. Today, both white and black South Africans share in the bounty the country has to offer, and at the same time, they share its burdens. Violent crime is one of the biggest and most horrifying of these burdens, and it should be noted that it doesn't disproportionately affect one race over another. Although certain widely publicized cases are indeed aggravated based on race and truly disgusting, it's important to remember that the crime reported by the media isn't representative of the whole picture. So with this in mind, let's stick to verifiable figures. After the end of apartheid in 1994, violent crime in South Africa initially increased by an average of 1.33% per year over the next two years. However, in the following years, there was a marked decrease in violent crime rates, with some years seeing a drop of as much as 11%. By 2011, violent crime had fallen to its lowest level in years, with fewer than 30 out of every 100,000 South Africans being victims of violent crime. Still a frighteningly high number, but a significant mark of progress and cause for optimism in South Africa. However, since 2011, the trend has sadly reversed and the crime rate has been increasing year on year. While the rate is still lower than it was in the mid-1990s, it has been rising steadily, indicating that there is still much work to be done to address the issue of violent crime in South Africa. For some, government inaction is the key issue here. After a recent cabinet shuffle, Bekeseli retained his post as police minister despite criticism from figures like Western Cape Premier Alan Winder. It is regrettable that President Ramaphosa did not use this excellent opportunity to appoint a capable and new minister of police to take policing into a new dimension, Winder said. The current minister has shown that he has no appetite to combat crime or create safer communities across our province. And then there are the glaring social issues too. A report from the World Bank in 2022 found that South Africa was the most unequal country in the world, with 80% of the wealth held by only 10% of the population. In other key areas, such as education, South Africa is also woefully lopsided, denying opportunities to so many people across the country. Of the nations in the Southern African Customs Union, Botswana, Eswatini, Lesotho, Namibia, and South Africa, SA is dead last. 
with the right direction and right focus on actually serving the South African public, the country has so much potential to become a safe, prosperous and inspiring place to live. For now though, that direction just isn't there and South Africans continue to suffer under incompetent leadership. The scars of apartheid are still very real and this context is crucial in understanding the problems of modern day South Africa. The year 1994 was a new dawn for South Africa and the beginning of something better for all people under a single uniting flag. At least, it should have been. While the apartheid era government is now decades behind us, cultural and racial issues still linger on and they have been made worse by government policies in recent decades. In 2003, the government launched the Black Economic Empowerment Act or BEE. The act was designed to redress much of the discrimination and disparity left over from the apartheid era and encourage the participation of disadvantaged groups in the workforce. The act, to put it bluntly, was a failure and it's been left open to abuse and manipulation and made it difficult for many South Africans to hold down jobs. Some believe that BEE placed undue pressure on small businesses that struggled to meet the requirements. This led to a process of ticking boxes and filling quotas rather than hiring based on merit. The result of this is an increase in resentment and festering mistrust between racial groups that were supposed to have ended with apartheid. Then there's the question of corruption, which never seems to be far away in South Africa. In 2015, Tegeta Resources won a huge contract with ESCOM, allegedly by supplying fraudulent BEE certification documents. As well as Tegeta, Enterprises Optimum and Trillion were also alleged to have won contracts in the same manner. The continuous shakeups and updates for BEE over the years has only served to increase red tape and make it harder for companies in South Africa to operate. It's clear that the manner in which the ANC government has handled the shifting economic conditions post-apartheid leaves much to be desired. Almost three decades after the end of apartheid, economic disparity, racial segregation and cultural resentment still exist in some form or another in South Africa and all still need to be meaningfully addressed. Hope, a brighter tomorrow, a country that all of us can share and be proud of. These are things that South Africans have desperately tried to hold on to despite the rapidly deteriorating conditions of the country. But many South Africans have already had enough. There's nothing wrong with this. If you've got the means to head elsewhere in search of a better life for you and your family, why shouldn't you? In fact, why wouldn't you? Statistics South Africa indicates that roughly 100,000 people leave South Africa per year, with an estimated 110,000 leaving in 2020 and an estimated 127,000 in 2019. And the figure might be even higher than this. In total, there are approximately 2.4 million South Africans residing overseas, with most seeking out greener pastures in Australia, the UK, the USA, and New Zealand. When you keep in mind that South Africa only has a total taxpaying base of 5.2 million individuals who supplied 40% of South Africa's total tax revenue in 2022, the amount of taxpaying South Africans leaving becomes staggering. To further add to the instability facing South Africa in the future, more than 53% of skilled university graduates said they might leave South Africa if the situation does not change. South Africa could be losing the very people best positioned to bring about a brighter future. The official unemployment rate in South Africa is expected to hit 35.6% in 2023. The disruptions caused by governments around the world during COVID hit South Africa hard and recovery has been slow. Currently, the percentage of people out of work in South Africa is the highest on the continent. This, coupled with massive rates of emigration, is shrinking the tax base, a tax base that has already been put through the ringer after years of instability and uncertainty. In an effort to counteract this, the government has suggested measures to increase the revenue flowing into state coffers. However, these measures have proved controversial. One of the proposed approaches was to reform the digital taxation system, generating revenue from companies such as Netflix and Amazon that are based abroad but draw significant profits from within South Africa's borders. This sounds feasible, but specialists have noted potential obstacles. One is that international bilateral taxation agreements are already in place, 
which may prevent South Africa from applying these taxes at all as international law trumps domestic law. Another is that many of the biggest targets for this new levy would be American corporations, such as Netflix and Amazon, which we've already mentioned. The fear is this could result in accusations of unfair treatment and leading to trading disagreements, further harming the South African economy. To grow the tax base, South Africa may be better served by looking inwards and solving some of the problems that are driving young, skilled workers away from the country. But what about those people still based in South Africa who rely on government funding and public works? For South African residents and taxpayers, there are still serious questions to be asked. For instance, where is the money going? Public infrastructure is in a sorry state. Of 824 municipal water treatment plants across the country in 2022, only 60 were releasing clean water. Hospitals in places like Gauteng, as well as elsewhere across the country, have been described as a mess, with the South African Medical Association putting a desperate appeal for intervention. And then there are other things we've discussed. The police, for example, are largely useless if you run into any serious bother, which unfortunately is more likely than in other parts of the world. And how about Michael Coburg, who relies on pumps, filters, and rainwater tanks for his home? And Selma Shipman, who can barely afford to run her generators on her pension? And what about the educational disparity we've touched upon? All these things mean money. Paying for private security, paying for your own utility solutions, paying for private healthcare and education. And all this while paying taxes as well, and high taxes at that, it's easy to see why so many people are now at their wits end. The tax black hole adds insult to injury. When we factor in the blatant corruption in the institutions that are supposed to serve ordinary South Africans, and the fact that there's money in the country, but it's just concentrated among the elite few politicians, it's a pretty bitter pill for taxpayers to swallow. In fact, of South Africa's 257 municipalities, only 16% received a clean audit in 2022. There's no clear answer to this one. The problems are evident at both ends, from the shrinking tax base to the seeming unaccountability of public coffers. The thing is, many South Africans still retain some semblance of pride for their country, and they'd be happy to pay taxes if they knew it would be going to something functional and worthwhile. By fixing the enormous wealth disparity and the mismanagement, for want of a better word, of public funds, public works can be funded in this way. It's just difficult to see an end to the current situation, and for many South Africans, they're simply done with seeing their taxes frittered away with nothing to show for it. When hard times push a country and a people to breaking point, sometimes, somehow, amazing things can happen. There's still voices of opposition in South Africa, and there's a growing understanding of the desperate conditions that the country faces. By rooting out corruption and fostering a sense of togetherness and shared engagement in South Africa, the new generation, the politicians, governors, scientists, and businessmen of tomorrow can forge a new path for the country. This will not come easily, and there are troubled times both at the current moment and in the years to come. But losing hope means losing everything. Despondency gets South Africa nowhere. Instead, if there's to be a bright future for this country at Africa's southern tip, it must come from solutions, real workable solutions that meet the desperate needs of the nation and its people. With this video, we set out to be honest, to lay bare the issues that are plaguing South Africa at present. This means confronting the facts, good and bad, and looking with clear eyes at what's gone wrong. We don't have any answers for the issues South Africa is facing, but we do know that modern South Africa is a beautiful thing despite all the turmoil. By confronting its failings and by tackling these issues head on, hopefully South Africa and her people can forge on and the country can regain a semblance of normality. But what do you think? Do you think South Africa's governing party, the ANC, will be voted out in 2024 after 30 years of controlling South African politics? If you're South African, let us know in the comments section below what your plan is. Are you staying or are you planning to leave? Let us know all that and more down below. As always guys, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.